chairman of the DNC AAPI caucus, Ms. Bell Leong Hong. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the DNC, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 AAPI Heritage Month celebration. Our theme is AAPI Stronger, as we celebrate our history, our resilience, and our power. Before we begin our star-studded program, I would like you to join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance with four of our beloved superstars. The pledge will be immediately followed by the national anthem to be performed by two-time Grammy award-winning singer and international actress, Tia Carrera. Please begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets I am so excited to welcome everyone back to celebrate our history, our resilience, and our power. Our theme is AAPI Stronger. Last year was full of challenges on many, many fronts. The pandemic took a toll on most of us as we had to be kept at home. We could not travel. We could not even see our dear ones in many cases. This pandemic forced us to learn new ways to conduct business, it made us very dependent on video technologies such as Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, and you name it. The truth is that in a way, the world actually became more accessible even if we were shut in. New words and phrases such as Zooming or you're muted became part of our vocabulary. This past year saw some monumental highs and some horrendous lows. As a community, we had to learn to come together and be strong. Never was that more evident than during this last election cycle. New heroes emerged, many of them unsung heroes. During the election, for the first time since I have been involved in politics, I saw our community come together as I had not seen before, highly focused on our mission and united in our purpose. Our very diverse community, composed of more than 30 ethnicities with diverse background, history, cultures, came together under the banners of AAPIs for Biden. 14 affinity groups, let me repeat, 14 affinity groups and 10 regional groups worked together in unity as never before under the leadership of Ahmed Yani and his leadership team, Howard Au. Webb Jane and Hannah Kim. 
and in close collaboration with DNC's own John Santos. They created the force multiplier that helped energize our API community to become the margin of victory. We now know that our API vote made the difference. Our voter turnout went up by 90% in Georgia alone, compared to a similar period in the 2016 elections. And this, is stor this story, by the way, was repeated all across the nations in battleground states. We must thank all of our tireless workers, all of you. Thanks to all of you and all of your tireless effort. Let me repeat, thanks to all of your tireless efforts, we were able to celebrate victories in elections in November, which gave us back the White House. And again in January to give us back the Senate. We celebrated everything virtually because of the restrictions of the pandemic. And yet we didn't let that inhibit us. We learned to innovate. We conducted convention and subsequently the election and also, yes, the inauguration in a largely virtual mode. I have to tell you that we had to do a lot of reimagining. Uh, uh, the world as we knew it today was not the way that we had to operate this last year. We learned new ways of achieving outstanding results in totally, totally new ma manners. In a year punctuated with so many highs, we also suffered the lowest of lows. As we saw the tide of anti-Asian hate crimes increase, fueled by the very purposeful use of language that inflamed and incited by people in authority that I dare say knew what they were doing. For most of last year, we saw authorities at the highest level say and do things that were not in the interest of the American people. Thank God we have people that care now in power. In the midst of that, heroes in, of that, all of that problem, heroes emerged with strong voices that pushed back, that were not afraid to call out falsehoods, that called it like it is, and always, always looked out for our community's best interest. I am honored to introduce one such hero next. She is my personal hero. I think I've told many people that all the time. She's a combat veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, a person of wisdom and grit, a patriot, a senator who is fearless and is one of the strongest advocates for us in the US Senate. Someone who I am honored to call my friend, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Will you please help me welcome our DNC Vice Chair, Tammy Duckworth. Hello, thank you for that warm introduction. As Vice Chair of the DNC, it is my honor to wish all of you a happy and joyous Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So much has changed since we marked this celebration last year. More Americans are getting vaccinated every day, and we are at the beginning to see the end of the pandemic. In just four months, the Biden-Harris administration has gotten millions of Americans vaccinated, back to work, back to school, and back on track. But some things have not changed for the better. We've also seen our community be being targeted by racist bias, bigotry, and violence, especially elderly Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander women. Even my own mother was harassed by an employee while she was just trying to pick up some grapes at the local grocery store. Yet instead of cowering in fear, our community has united against hate. We donated PPE to frontline healthcare workers, distributed food at pantries and organized safety patrols for our senior citizens. President Biden signed a memorandum to prevent hate in his first week in office. And last week, he signed into law our legislation to address the alarming spike in anti-AANHPI hate crimes that we've seen across the country. While this is progress, we still have more to do to restore hope to the American people, to improve lives, as well as to relieve, to relieve the pain and pressure that so many of us have felt for such a long time. I am thrilled to be working with Chair Jamie Harrison, DNC AAPI Caucus Chair Bill Leong Hong, and all of you to get the job done. Together, we are stronger. Together, we will stop the hate terrorizing our fellow Americans. Together, we can elect the leaders who reflect our values and represent our cultures. Happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, everybody. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Bobby Scott. Thank you, and happy AAPI Heritage Month. And it's certainly a pleasure to bring greetings on behalf uh, from the United States Congress. And I think it's important to note that we have a theme uh, of um, history, resilience, and power that's certainly appropriate. We're celebrating the history of uh, in all areas of the United States, business, sports, culture, charitable, political, every aspect of American life, we know that AAPIs are, are participating and that is a cause for celebration. We also know that the AAPI community has been resil resilient. We have, um, we have successfully gotten through or just about through the pandemic, just like everyone else, but we had the added sufferance of the reprehensible bigotry from many sectors, including one who enabled through language and otherwise uh, made sure that people uh, did not respect the Asian community. But we've uh, we're getting past that. Uh, even the uh, let, but even the legislation that uh, Senator Duckworth mentioned uh, that passed uh, recognizing the, uh, um, the the horror of the tragedy in Atlanta, the vote on that was unanimous amongst Democrats, but it was not unanimous overall. And so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have uh, we have the power, and that's what is so important and the power makes a difference. There's no question that the API vote uh, was instrumental in electing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and AAPI first. Uh, we also were very instrumental in electing two Georgia senators. And I think you can see the difference in the American Rescue Plan when people got $1,400 checks, unprecedented funding for education. We saved millions of people their pensions cut child poverty in half. None of that would have been possible without the election of both uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, as well as the two senators in Georgia. And the AAPI vote was, was crucial. Uh, so as we celebrate AAPI uh, Heritage Month, let's not forget the power that we have to make a difference. And I wanna thank the uh, uh, National Democratic uh, Co Committee for having the uh, giving us the opportunity to celebrate AAPI uh, Heritage Month, and thank uh, Bell particularly for all of the work that you do. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award-nominated producer Palin Chow. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here today and part of this joyous celebration. Um, thanks so much to Bell and the DNC for this kind invitation. I am honored to introduce my short PSA film, Awakening, which is at its heart a celebration of the AAPI community with a spotlight on how we've changed the world through art and storytelling. I conceived this project shortly after the incidents in Atlanta, where like all of you, I felt horrified and angry and wanted so badly to do something. As a filmmaker and an animated film producer, I decided to approach this the only way I knew how, by telling stories. To me, Awakening is an anthemic celebration of Asian America. It acknowledges the ongoing frustrations the AAPI community has faced, particularly over this past year, but it also shares a message that is uplifting, emboldening, and empowering. My reason for naming the film Awakening was twofold. The first is that it represents to me an awakening in our country, an acknowledgement of all the challenges that the AAPI community is still facing, but also all that we have achieved and how we truly at the, are at the core of what it means to be American. And the second is that it speaks to an awakening that I believe is happening within the AAPI community, a new united community that has come together in the realization that now is the time to speak up, stand tall, and truly be proud of who we are. And so now without further ado, Awakening, I hope you enjoy it. We are heartbroken. We are grieving. We are 
in pain. We are frustrated. We are angry. We are outraged. We're scared. We're scared for our friends and family. I think we're feeling despair. Uh, and I think we're questioning our place in this country. Many people sacrificed everything they had to, to come here because they, they believe that this is a place for kind, courageous, strong, and fair people. I think we are wildly misunderstood. We don't feel seen. The only thing that all Asian Americans have in common in this country is that they have experienced racism. I felt extremely hurt and angry. And at the same time, I felt inspired to finally stand up and say, no, that's not right. How would I describe Asian Americans that I know? They are everything. I am Chinese American. I'm Taiwanese American. I am a naturalized Japanese American. I'm Indian American. I am a Chinese Filipina American. I'm a proud Korean American. We are hilarious. We are generous, kind, multiracial. We are resilient. We are courageous. Heroic. We are creative. We have grand dreams. Empathetic, open-minded. The Asian Americans I know um, are outspoken, are expressive, are... <laughs> very lazy, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about myself. We're brilliant, we are wild, we're crazy. We are phenomenal. Emotional, organized, clumsy. We're just like everyone else. I'm an animator, illustrator, and director. I'm a show creator, executive producer. I'm a playwright and screenwriter. I'm an animation producer. I am a comedian, an actor, an activist. I'm a composer, songwriter. I'm an actor, comedian, writer, producer. We are American. We are American. We are American. We are American. What draws me to animation is really that your only limitations are your imagination. It almost takes things like race, class, gender, and it transcends those ideas. I think the special thing about animation is it's the first real content you see in your life. As a child, it has a huge impact. If Fei Fei really spoke to your heart, she was voiced by me. If you had cried on the opening minutes of the movie Up, that was me. If watching Clouds brought your family closer around the holidays, that was produced by me. If you thought that stand-up comedy by Asian Americans was amazing, well, guess who started it? That was me. If you thought Chana was fierce and beautiful and fabulous, that was voiced by me. If you loved the movie How to Train Your Dragon 2, I was a storyboard artist on that. If you liked Chief Benja in Raya and the Last Dragon and you loved the idea of unity, that was me. If you've seen the movie Kubo and the Two Strings, Kubo was my nickname growing up. That character is me. If you love Toy Story 1 or 2 or 3, I worked on all three of them, then you love me. Can you imagine writing eight shows that made it to Broadway? That was me. If you fell in love with Over the Moon, that was produced by us. And I co-wrote the Ultra Luminary songs. If you loved exploring the high seas with Moana, I was a part of making that. If you loved watching Hotel Transylvania with your family, I was the storyboard artist on that. Did you laugh till you cried watching SNL? I helped create that. Remember when Poe finally met his dad? If you enjoyed Kofu Panda 2 or 3, I directed those. If watching Gobi made you laugh. Sometimes it causes me to get a little tongue-tied. That was me. If you were in love with or had a crush on or lusted after Captain Dick Shang in Disney's Mulan, guess what? That was me. I did that. That was me. Oh, that? Me. I wrote that. I made that. That? That was me. That was me. That was me. That was me. We did that. That was all of us together. I'm fighting for my aunties, my cousins, my family, everyone who feels like home to me. I'm fighting for new voices. I'm fighting for young people 
who are going to be the next generation of artists and leaders and culture makers. I wish for a world of tolerance, empathy, compassion. I would love to see a time where every 10-year-old child can watch TV and no matter who the cast is made up of, they don't think twice about who's not included because everyone is. For the future, I wish to be fearless. I wish that all people were less afraid because of course it's fear that causes people to mistreat each other. We have so many problems, but we can change that. We can change everything. My call to action would be speak up. Even if your voice shakes, speak up. Be loud. Take up space. Be yourself. Be proud of who you are. You can sign up for bystander intervention training. So you can support local, small, Asian businesses in your area or not in your area. Be active, be responsible, be compassionate. Let's educate ourselves about Asian American history. Never allow yourself to be silenced or invisibilized. You belong here. Know that you're not alone. Please tell your stories. Let people know who we are and what our lives are really like. If you want the violence to stop, then you have to speak up. If you want the racist representations of Asians to stop on screen, then you have to speak up. Stop Asian hate. Stop Asian hate. Stop Stop. Asian. Stop. 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 Asian hate. It's time to truly be proud of who we are and shout it from the rooftops and open our hearts and our lives to everyone, for everyone to see. Oh my God, that was so beautiful, so strong. So, such a very powerful message, Palin. United community and standing proud. Oh yes, thank you, Palin. Thank you very much for sharing that very powerful video and message with all of us. And it is a perfect segue for our next speaker. So thank you very much, Palin. I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing my dear friend, Erica Maritsugu, Senior White House AANHPI liaison. I have had the pleasure of knowing Erica since 2004, when we both went down to Florida to campaign for John Kerry. Now, Erica, please, if you don't tell any stories, I won't. Okay, is that a promise? <laughs> So nothing about so nothing about dancing, right? No, 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 Over the years, I have watched with admiration her strong public service career. She gave up a lucrative career in the private sector to enter public service. She served on the Senate Democratic Party policy staff and in the Democratic administration. She rose to become the Assistant Secretary of HUD under President Obama. She then also served as Senior Counsel to Senator Duckworth, and most recently, she was an executive in a nonprofit organization. I am so delighted that she can join us today, both to tell us about herself and to introduce the next segment. Please help me welcome someone who I call a very dear friend, Erica Moritsubi. Thank you, Belle. Belle, thank you. Have I thanked you lately? <laughs> right? It's an honor to be here with you and your esteemed lineup of leaders who come together tonight to celebrate Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Now, as, Be as Belle alluded, I've, I've spent my entire life as a professional and as a volunteer fighting for social justice and the empowerment of communities and individuals. And I get to continue to do that in the White House. We have the confidence of a president and a vice president who see us and hear us and value us. And they're committed to providing us with the safety and opportunity that we should expect and can now hope for. On his first day in office, President Biden signed an executive order advancing racial equity throughout the federal government. 
In response to the spike in anti-Asian hate and violence, the president acted quickly and resolutely in his first week in office by issuing a presidential memorandum condemning racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against AA and NHPI communities. And we've spent every day since then fighting hate. Just last week, the president signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act uh, that Senator Duckworth mentioned in her remarks. It passed by an overwhelming margin. This critical legislation will bring our nation one step closer to achieving justice and equality for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities and all marginalized individuals who are the targets of hate. I'm actually not going to talk much more about this new law. I prefer to defer to our Madam Vice President's brilliant words on the matter. So here she is with her remarks from the bill signing ceremony. Mahalo Democrats for including me tonight. Abby, I think we can roll the tape. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me start by saying to all of the leaders here, thank you, thank you. To the members of our United States Congress on both sides of the aisle who helped pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Thank you. And a special thanks to Senator Maisie Hirono. And Congresswoman Grace Meng. For leading this incredible effort. And I know you did not do it alone. And there are many more. I could name a couple of whom I will. Among them, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Senator Richard Blumenthal. Yeah. Senator Jerry Moran. Yeah. Congresswoman Judy Chu. Yeah. Congressman Don Beyer. Yeah. And Congressman Fred Upton. Because of you, history will remember this day and this moment when our nation took action to combat hate. Thank you all. Around this time last year, when I was in the Senate, Senator Hirono and Senator Duckworth and I introduced a resolution in the United States Senate condemning the rise of anti-Asian sentiment in our country. At that time, more than 1,100 anti-Asian hate incidents had been reported since the start of the pandemic. Today, that number is more than 6,600. And I'm talking about incidents where businesses are being vandalized in our biggest cities and in our smallest towns. I'm talking about a 61-year-old man getting kicked in the head, two elderly women being stabbed while waiting for the bus. Eight people in Atlanta getting shot on a Tuesday night. This violence, it did not come from nowhere. And none of it is new. In my life, my lived experience, I have seen how hate can pervade our communities. I have served in the justice system, in the legislative branch, and in the executive branch. I have seen how hate can impede our progress. And I have seen how people uniting against hate can strengthen our country. Those here today are united. This bill brings us one step closer to stopping hate, not only for Asian Americans, but for all Americans. It will expedite the Justice Department's review of hate crimes, every type of hate crime. It will designate an official at the department to oversee the effort. And it will expand efforts to make the reporting of hate crimes more accessible at the local and state levels. But after the president signs this bill today, 
our work will not be done. Here is the truth. Racism exists in America. Xenophobia exists in America. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, it all exists. And so the work to address injustice, wherever it exists, remains the work ahead. My fellow Americans, it is my great honor to mention and to say to you what you already know. We have a President of the United States in one Joe Biden who is committed to this work. He is determined to, I will quote from him, give hate no safe harbor. And I'll tell you firsthand, I've seen what you know. His actions match his powerful words. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmy-winning actor and international recording artist, Darren Chris. Hello to all my AAPI brothers and sisters. Uh, thank you for joining us for this, uh, this little event. Uh, I do wish we could be together in person. Um, I know that's what we've been saying for more than a year and a half now, but as we slowly start to get back to a new normal, um, I, I, do, I do miss seeing everybody together, particularly for something like this, which is celebrating AAPI Heritage Month, and it's so fun to see everyone's faces and be together and celebrate the togetherness of our many cultures that make up the AAPI community, myself representing the PI part of it as a half Filipino kid myself. Um, it's a community that I'm very proud to be a part of, and uh, I'm very, uh, I feel very grateful that I have, I'm a small part of uh, allowing those folks to be seen in, in, in parts of the entertainment community. Um, one of the great things about uh, celebrating anybody's heritage is that you get to kind of create a communion with people who have had a similar experience and you kind of lessen the distance between you and other people who have also had that experience. And even though this month is AAPI Heritage Month specifically for uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, it's, uh, it's a month to celebrate all people who have been, you know, historically marginalized and uh, people we still continue to fight for uh, to be seen and to be represented in, uh, in, in, a, in a good and uh, fair light. So um, this is a song that is um, kind of about reaching out to all the people that have had experiences that have tied them together for, for better or for worse, all the things that we celebrate about our, our communities and all the things that we fight for in our communities um, are things that, that, that pull us together. Um, and we are pulled together by the very sentiment that we know that we are not alone. And the song is called Not Alone.
trouble. I'll trip and stumble trying to make sense of things sometimes. piano has seen better days, but uh, the song sentiment remains strong and genuine. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, wishing you guys all the best this month. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Ted Liu. I'm Congressman Ted Liu, wishing you a happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As all of you know, there has been a surge in hate crimes and hate incidents against the AAPI community. One report showed that hate crimes against Asian Americans increased nearly 150% in major cities across America last year. Another report showed that one in four Asian American students were the victims of racial bullying. Despite all that, let me tell you what gives me hope. First, the American people rose up and fired the former president, who used racist phrases like Kung Flu. Second, in the last few months, we've seen a number of rallies across America in support of the AAPI community. These rallies weren't massive, but they weren't small either. And they were appearing in small towns and large cities and everywhere in between. And third, you have attention to this issue being paid by the highest levels of our government. President Biden issued an executive memorandum to combat hate against the AAPI community. The president and vice president visited with Asian American leaders in Georgia. In Congress, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act passed the Senate and the House of Representatives on a bipartisan basis. I'm pleased to be a co-author of that act, and President Biden has signed it into law. If all of this had happened during World War II, I'm not sure Japanese Americans would have been interned. We're in a different political situation, and you're seeing the political awakening of the AAPI community. Since 2000, the Asian American community has more than doubled in size. According to Pew Research, Asian Americans are the fastest rising ethnic group in America, and by 2055, Asian Americans are projected to be the largest immigrant group in America. I look forward to working with all of you as we make our country a more perfect union and an even better place to live, work, and play. Thank you. The 2020 elections were perhaps the most consequential in U.S. history. On January 6th, we saw exactly why. The future of our democracy was on the line. To win, it would take all of us, every single one of us. And we answered the call. The AAPI community came together like never before. Including the largest surrogate coalition we've ever seen. We volunteered. We phone banked. Registered voters. Wrote postcards. A lot of postcards. Text banks. Held Zoom rallies. And there's definitely a lot of Zooming. So much Zooming. We canvassed. 
And then we phone banked some more. Did he mention phone banking? We even fought disinformation. Mom, Dad, please stay off the WhatsApp, WeChat, Cup. And yes, we even knocked on doors. Wearing masks, of course. But we never lost hope. We never gave up. Because every vote counts. And boy, did we need every vote to get the job done. Every Bangladeshi American vote. Every Chinese American vote. Every Hmong American vote. Every Indian American vote. Every Indonesian Chinese American vote. Every Thai American vote. Every Taiwanese American vote. Every Vietnamese American vote. Every Pakistani American vote. Every Sri Lankan American vote. Every Filipino American vote. Every Japanese American vote. Every Pacific Islander vote. Every Asian American vote. Every Sikh, Nepali, Bhutani, South Asian American vote. The election was so close, I think they're still counting votes in Arizona. But together, we became strong. AAPI strong. AAPI voter turnout in 2020 was almost 150% that of 2016 even higher in battleground states. That is nearly four times the increase of all other voters. We also helped deliver critical wins in Georgia, where the increase in API turnout was nearly five times greater than the margin of victory. And we are just getting started. In the face of those who wish to silence us, we are getting stronger. In the face of gun violence, we are getting stronger. In the face of Asian hate, we are getting stronger. In the face of economic adversity, we are getting stronger. 2020 was a historic year for the AAPI community. We served on the front lines of the pandemic. We showed up to be the margin of victory. We united to stop Asian hate. And we are only getting stronger. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. Happy, Happy AAPI, AAPI Heritage, Heritage Month. Month. That was such a wonderful, wonderful video. Watching it made me emotional. It reminded me of the powerful moments that we created last election, of the work we did at the DNC leading up to the election, the investments we made that laid the foundation for a lot of activism during this last cycle. Activism that is now widely recognized as resulting in becoming the margin of victory in this last election. It reminded me of the unity of purpose where the DNC and the campaign work in unison. And let me tell you that it didn't happen like that every single time. This time though, it did. It reminded me of the hard work and most importantly, the leadership of the amazing band of leaders each and every one an outstanding example of patriotism, commitment, excellence, and leadership. We did not get a proper chance to thank these leaders who worked so hard around the clock, cooperatively and very innovatively to achieve the common goal of electing a democratic president and electing Democrats up and down the ballot. So I wanna take this opportunity to commend them to you, Mr. Chairman, to thank them publicly for everything that they have done, not only last year during the presidential election, but again in January during the runoff election. And yes, to thank them in advance for what they're going to continue to do in 2022 and 2024 to help us win the midterm and the next general election. We want to especially thank the outstanding leadership of Ahmed Yani and his leadership team, Howard Al, Viva Jane, and Hannah Kim, and thank the leaders and members of each of the 14 affinity groups and subgroups and the leaders of the regional API leaders. You saw them on the video just now. That is just scratching the surface. Under their leadership, there were many, many, many hundreds more and they formed a battalion that was uh, awesome to behold. We owe you all a debt of gratitude for being the catalyst for APIs becoming the margin of victory in this election. 
So with that, I would like to commend them uh, to you, to, uh, to our chair, Jamie Harrison, uh, for him to thank you also uh, on, on all of our behalf. So with that, next, I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing my DNC chairman and my good friend, Jamie Harrison. So Jamie was elected unanimously in January, on January 21 this year to become our chairman. Now, many of you remember that he ran a very, very uh, spirited campaign, very outstanding. And just for a few votes, just for a few, few votes, we might have won that Senate seat in South Carolina against Lindsey uh, uh, Graham. In fact, I don't, I don't even want to say his name, but you know. What you may not know is that I have known Jamie for more than a decade when we were both in the executive committee at the DNC, when he was first elected as the first African-American chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. He has been a first in many, many areas. But to me, he is first and foremost, my friend, my leader, my chairman. Would you please help me introduce, help me welcome Jamie Harrison. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, you know, your career and your tireless efforts on behalf of Asian Americans and women are an inspiration to us all. So thank you so much, Bill, for all that you do. I, I also want to thank DNC Vice Chair Senator Tammy Duckworth, former DNC Vice Chair, my good friend Grace Ming, KPAC Chair Representative Judy Chu, Representative Mark Takano, Representative Kai Ka, uh, Kahilei, Representative Raja Krishnamurthy and Representative Ted Liu for joining us. And I'm glad to see my friend Erica uh, Morsigu, uh, Mor uh, excuse me, Erica <coughs> Morsigu, uh, who's the Deputy Assistant to the President and the AANHPI Senior Liaison. I wanna, uh, she joined us earlier to introduce the forceful remarks from our Vice President Kamala Harris. I also wanna thank AAPIs for Biden and all of its affinity groups and state leadership councils. You know, it's important to me that all of you are recognized. And if we had the time, I would name each and every one of you individually. That is one of the reasons we celebrate AAPI Heritage, Heritage Month. People of color, especially Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, become othered to the point that they're not seen, that they're not valued. But we saw you in that inspiring video. We saw you in the phone bank and we saw you zooming throughout the campaign. We've seen the data that shows AAPI turnout increased by nearly 48% in 2020. And now we see the bigotry and the violence the AAPI community has had to endure. My friends, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but violence against Asian Americans is violence against all Americans, period. And one of the ways we stop AAPI hate is to work for a government that sees you and hears you. We need to elect more leaders from the AAPI community who understand what your needs are and what your goals are, but who most importantly understands that there is no single AAPI community. A Chinese American family in New York has different priorities from among um, American family in Minnesota. The Pacific Islander community in California has different issues from the Vietnamese community in Texas. A Korean American voter in Georgia faces different challenges to voting from the Indian American voter in Pennsylvania. Folks, all of the communities represented here today help propel Democrats to victory in 2020, and we're not going to forget you. That's why President Biden is committed to building a diverse administration, because he understands that representation matters. Our leaders need to understand where we are coming from, and these leaders are getting the job done. Now, speaking of getting the job done, I am in awe of the work of my friend, the DNC Vice Chair and Senator Tammy Duckworth, along with Senator Maisie Hirano and Representative Grace Ming, and so many others who worked to send the COVID-19 hate crimes bill to President Biden's desk. And he proudly signed that into law last week. And we have to thank organizers and activists across the nation, as well as powerful voices as, uh, like Daniel Day Kim, who were recognizing 
as a champ, who we are recognizing as a champion for the community for his leadership in raising the awareness of Asian hate crimes. That's just a couple of examples of what we can do when we work together. But there's so much more. You know, in just four months, we passed the American Rescue Plan. We are tackling the pandemic head on. We're delivering much needed help to American families. We're making investments to rescue and rebuild our economy. And with the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan, we're gonna do so much more. My friends, this is the government that you elected and it's gonna to continue to serve your best interests because that is what leaders are supposed to do. Leaders are supposed to serve everyone. As Vice President Harris has said, our unity is our strength and our diversity is our power. We reject the myth of us versus them. We're all in this together. Folks, thank you for being in this with us. Thank you for all of your contributions that help enrich and define American culture. Thank you for uh, persevering during a year filled with so much misplaced anger and blame. Your support is why we're able to make so much progress as a nation and we'll continue our success together with your continued commitment. Thank you, Chairman Harris. Chairman, <laughs> excuse me, Chairman Harrison. <laughs> get my have to get my uh, mouth engaged here. Now you all know why I am so high on Jamie Harrison. He is not only uh, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. He believes in us, and he is walking the the uh, uh, with us in our journey together. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate you. I am delighted next to introduce Daniel Day Kim as a champion of the DNC. Uh, Daniel Day Kim is an actor, a director, a producer, and an activist. He recognizes and uses his very strong voice, which is magnified by his celebrity status for the betterment of our community and on issues that are important to us. It is this conscious use of his important voice that brought media attention to an issue that has plagued our community for a long time, the issue of anti-Asian hate. The surge of anti-Asian hate crime came to a crescendo when our elderly were being attacked without provocation on the streets of San Francisco, San Jose, New York City. Until Daniel Day Kim used his megaphone to shine a harsh light on this ugly reality, the media was not paying any attention to our plight. And let me tell you that our legislators, our Congress members, Congresswoman Meng, Congresswoman Chu, uh, Congresswoman Hirono, Cong um, Senator, I'm sorry, Sen Senator Hirono, Senator Duckworth, and all of our uh, congressional delegation have been sounding the alarm all year long. But sometimes it takes that extra star power, that megaphone to turn the corner. And, and it is because of his actions that it was a turning point. He is a change maker. And for that, we honor Daniel Day Kim with the title of champion of change. May I introduce you to Daniel Day Kim, my hero. Thanks. Debbie, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Grace Meng. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm willing to go back because I don't want to disappoint anyone if they were expecting Daniel Day Kim. <laughs> I think he sent a message for us if, if they want to play that yes, first. Uh-oh. Well, I may um, start first as they get the video later and apologies. I will do everything but, I can to make sure we get Daniel Jacob back. Rest assured. Well, let me, let me do the proper introduction for, okay. uh, for our Congresswoman Rep, uh, uh, Meng. Um, so for the longest, for the last four years, I have had the privilege of serving uh, with Congre Congresswoman Grace Meng when she was vice chair of the DNC. And I have to, to tell you, she has been not only my, my very best friend, 
but my mentor and my ally. Uh, we traveled to many places together these last four years when we were able to. And even when a pandemic hit and we were not able to travel, she and I very often appeared on events together to essentially encourage the voters to come out and to help um, our uh, activists and our, uh, our workers uh, to move forward with all of their work. Congresswoman Meng is, has been an absolute champion for all of our communities, not only for her own district, but for each and every one of us in Congress. She is the author of the bill that was signed by the president uh, last Thursday. Uh, uh, and uh, I have to tell you that uh, it was a labor of love and of intense, um, intense uh, activity. So thank you very much for your leadership. And would you all please help me welcome uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much, um, Belle, for your friendship and for your vision and leadership for our community and our party. And thank you for never giving up on our community. Thank you so much to Chairman Harrison for your leadership. Uh, I just love the work that you are doing and how every day you and the entire team at the DNC show Americans all across the country that Democrats care not just in words, but by action as well. And I wanna just let everyone know that in the aftermath of the Atlanta, Georgia uh, murders, uh, Chairman Harrison was the very first person to reach out to me and to leaders like Bell that same evening um, and pledged to do whatever he could to continue to stand in solidarity with our community and continue to reach out from the White House to local uh, leaders to make sure that we felt supported in words and action. Um, and I wanna say a special thank you to so many of the AAPIs for Biden affinity groups for turning out what a tremendous margin of victory you all helped deliver this past cycle. We, our country is incredibly grateful to you. Um, you helped flip the Senate. You literally helped make legislation like the American Rescue Plan possible. And we are incredibly proud of your hard work. And as I congratulate and commend you, I will also say that our jobs continue. I am here for you. We cannot give up now. We have to continue to build off of the progress that we have already made. Build back better. It applies to all of us here um, as well. But you know, our country's ability to draw hardworking people from every culture and nation has always made this nation stronger. We've seen how President Biden has turned bold progressive ideas into tangible results for our community. And while we were all zooming across the country during the campaign this past year, we saw Joe's priorities for the AAPI community um, elevated and included in so many ways. And we know that our community has really been living in fear over the last year. Parents telling their kids they can't go out to play, people telling their parents and their grandparents that they can't go outside uh, because something might, might happen to them. And we've seen things happen. We've seen it on videos and the news and in social media, and people are literally terrified. Uh, I wanna take a moment to thank our president. How good does that sound and how good does that feel? I wanna thank our president for from the very first day of his administration, pledging to do whatever he could with our vice president, Paris, um, to work with and to support and to stand in solidarity with the AAPI community. Um, I rarely get to see legislation move so fast in the Congress, through the Senate, through the House, uh, onto the desk of the president. Um, and it felt quite good to go back to the White House again. Um, but really, thank you to President Biden for signing this legislation that would really provide more accountability into how 
uh, we are collecting data for these uh, bias incidents and hate crimes, uh, over 80% of which are never even reported to the federal government finding resources to make it easier for victims to report their cases uh, online and in multiple languages and to reach out locally to give guidance on how to more effectively investigate these types of incidents. Um, and so I'm really thankful, special thank you to um, Senator Hirono who shepherded the legislation uh, and of course to Majority Leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi for their tremendous work as well. And I will leave with saying that as an Asian American in this country, I've never felt such a widespread showing of support from so many different communities uh, across this country. I'm incredibly encouraged. Over the last few months and years, we've marched against anti-Semitism. We've marched to say no to the Muslim ban. We've marched to say that Black Lives Matter and now so many of these communities and more have stood together with the AAPI community. And I wanna say that we are all together making history. We are working together in ways that we've never done before. Many of you have made that possible electorally and politically throughout the country. And we have to continue to, to build on that. So thank you so much to all of you for all of your efforts and your hard work. I'm so proud of you and thank you and wanted to take this chance to thank you all for literally helping to improve the lives of Americans around this country again. Happy APA month. I know that over the past year, you have been increasingly using your platforms to spotlight what's happening in the Asian American community. What prompted you to do it and why are you continuing to do it? Uh, what prompted me to do it was the continuing drumbeat of incidents that were populating my feed on a daily basis. Mr. Kim, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cohen and uh, Ranking Member Roy and members of the Judici Judiciary Committee. I'm both honored and dismayed to be back in front of you again. Some of you may remember that I was with you just this past September discussing the importance of diversity in American media. You may recall uh, that the reason I was moved to speak then was because the House had just recently passed H.R. 908, condemning all forms of anti-hate Asian sentiment. But I was disheartened to find that for a bill that required no money or resources, just a simple condemnation of acts of hate against people of Asian descent, 164 members of Congress, all Republican, voted against it. And now here I am again, because as every witness in this hearing has pointed out, the situation has gotten worse, much worse. Statistically insignificant literally means we don't matter. We as Asian Americans have come to this country because we believe in the American dream. When we are erased from our history books, we are made invisible. And the result, to quote Congresswoman Meng, is that we are perpetually made to feel like foreigners in our own country. Include our stories because they matter. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm gonna convince all of you to stand up for us. Trust me, I've seen your voting records. But I am speaking to those to whom humanity still matters. In closing, let me just say that there are several moments in a country's history that chart its course indelibly for the future. For Asian Americans, that moment is now. What happens right now and over the course of the coming months will send a message for generations to come as to whether we matter, whether the country we call home chooses to erase us or include us, dismiss us or respect us, invisibilize us or see us because you may consider us statistically insignificant now, but one more fact that has no alternative is that we are the fastest growing racial demographic in the country. We are 23 million strong. We are united and we are waking up. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh... Wow. Uh, thank you so much to the DNC and to Chairman Harrison for this very nice recognition. Uh, as we all know, uh, these have been some exceptional times for the AAPI community. So I really appreciate the fact that the DNC created tonight's event to celebrate us during this special month. And it's really nice to be considered an AAPI champion. But honestly, I don't see myself as any more of a champion than many of you. 
uh, the work that we continue to do and the progress that we've made over these past few months has only been because of a collective effort and one where I've really only played a small part. In reality, I'm inspired by so many others. People who have been showing up, standing up and speaking up. These are our community leaders like Sonal Shaw and John Yang, Ai-jen Pu, Jose Antonio Vargas, Tammy Cho, to politicians like members of Congress, Grace Meng, Andy Kim, Ted Liu, and Senators Hirono and Duckworth, and of course, my fellow actors and artist activists, people like Lisa Ling, Ken Jeong, David Henry Huang, uh, Baon Nguyen, Olivia Munn, and all the Asian American Avengers out there. And I cannot forget allies that include many of you. There are so many more of us who have answered this call and done much more significant work than I have. So if there's anything I'm happy to use my time tonight to recognize, it is the fact that along with allies like you, we are uniting in unprecedented ways and being reminded that Asian American is worth celebrating, not just this month, but always. And beyond that, that diversity is worth celebrating. See, I'd even go so far as to say that despite what certain people would have you believe, Diversity is a big part of what continues to make America great. And I appreciate the DNC for embracing that idea as a real pathway to a better future for all of us. Thank you again for this recognition. Have a great evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Kai Kehele. Aloha. Well, it's big shoes to fill following Daniel Day Kim, but I also want to echo what Congresswoman Grace Meng and others have said, um, which is thank you to our AAPI community. You know, it's an honor for me to be here. I'm Congressman Kai Kahele. I am uh, zooming in with you live from Hilo, Hawaii, my hometown here in the Hawaiian Islands. And I also want to mahalo the DNC. I want to also mahalo Bell Leong Hong and all of you throughout our country who have done so much to support the Democratic National Committee and the Democratic Party uh, that have put us in position to be effective uh, and to make a difference at the national level. Like Congresswoman Grace Meng said, we would not have been able to get the COVID-19 hate crime bill to President Biden's desk if it were not for a united Congress in the Senate, in the House, and of course in the White House. You know, I have the honor of representing uh, the great state of Hawaii and, and I also have the honor of being uh, a native Hawaiian who represents Hawaii in Congress, one of only two since statehood and one of only seven in the history of the Hawaiian Islands since Hawaii became a United States territory in 1898. Now the Hawaiian Islands, many of, uh, of you have been to uh, or, or, or have, have had a chance to come to Hawaii. It's a beautiful place uh, settled about 800 years ago um, and uh, by the early Polynesians. And we are really a, a multicultural state, you know, one that has a deep history uh, and has um, a multi-ethnic history where people from all over the Pacific, from China, from Korea, from the Philippines, um, and, and many other nations have migrated to the Hawaiian Islands um, to, uh, to work and to, to start a new life. And so, you know, for me, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, in the month of May uh, was when President Biden on April 30th, uh, just before the start of the month of May, proclaimed uh, that the month of May would be AANHPI Heritage Month. It's the first time that a sitting president has specifically and explicitly acknowledged Native Hawaiians in the recognition of the AAPI Heritage Month in the month of May. So as a native Hawaiian, I'm very proud uh, um, to have the president do that. Bell was sitting uh, just two seats away from me on Thursday uh, in the East Room to witness a historic signing. And the president again said the word native Hawaiians when he recognized AANHPI Heritage Month, which is really important. And it goes back to what the president has said many times before, that words matter. And so on behalf of uh, the great state of Hawaii uh, and the Democratic Party, um, you know, I just want to say thank you and mahalo to uh, AAPIs across the country. And uh, I would just like to say to our, our esteemed DNC chair, Jamie Harrison, that uh, 
I'm, I'm committed to bring you out to Hawaii so we can help you properly pronounce um, my last name and uh, Senator Hirono's last name and uh, you know other um, uh, Erica Muritsugi's last name and uh, you know get get you uh, um, uh, pronouncing the, the Hawaiian language uh, and uh, our API languages out here in Hawaii. So thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and I look forward to working with all of you over the next year and a half uh, because we have a lot of work to do to retain the House of Representatives, to make sure we retain the United States Senate. We have our work cut out for us, but working together with the leadership of Jamie Harrison and APIs across the country, um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you for having me and aloha. Hi, I'm Lou Diamond Phillips. So growing up, I spent a lot of time on Navy bases. I grew up on Navy bases around the world. And so uh, my peers were a lot of uh, multiracial, mixed heritage, you know, kids like me. Many people know I grew up in a, a family of um, uh, Indian parents, but with a black stepfather. And that brought a richness to my life, which I, I is immeasurable. For the most part, um, I just felt like, you know, an American kid. I was an American kid growing up, uh, albeit one who ate a lot of pancit and lumpia. The interesting thing about growing up with a black stepfather was that um, I think my sisters and mother and I and my stepfather experienced life outside of our home based on the shades of darkness of our skin. So we went through life with the world receiving us in a very certain way. Quite honestly, it wasn't until uh, I started applying for colleges that I noticed that something was different. The black man who walked out of the house was received differently than me. And I looked Hispanic. My one other sister looked Chinese. My other sister looked Middle Eastern. When, uh, when asked to check your, you know, uh, uh, racial heritage, <laughs> most of the time I had to check other. And it's just interesting to see just how the world treats all of those shades differently. And then after that, you know, uh, going to college, especially in Texas, you know, I started, I started dealing with racism, you know, for the first time and being made to feel different, uh, being hired as a busboy, but not a waiter, you know, little things like that. And when I got to Hollywood, uh, those boxes, believe it or not, uh, became more rigid because people always try to put a label on you. Uh, uh, even, even in our industry, um, they wanna know what you are, who you are, where you came from, how can we categorize you? Uh, and it has been, um, the mission of my career to to break down those walls and to uh, uh, break open those boxes and refuse to be put into them. Uh, it becomes even more difficult when you're of mixed heritage because, you know, um, you're, a, you're a lot of different things. My mother married a black man. My son has a Mexican girlfriend. My nephew has a Chinese girlfriend. For me, the more ethnic minorities that come together, the better. What I would say to their next generation is it is incumbent upon you to uh, embrace who you are, to know your roots, to be proud of that, and to use your voice. And by doing so, you are going to further uh, uh, our involvement and our representation uh, in this country, in whatever industry you're in, uh, so that, that these advancements are not forgotten. There are forces out there that would like to, you know, regress, to go backwards, to take away your voice. You cannot allow that. And one of the things I am so thrilled about with this moment is this sort of alignment of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement with the AAPI um, movement to stop Asian hate. We are banding together so that our voices are stronger, so that our platform is bigger, uh, our megaphone is more amplified. Because I've never felt that we should be separate. I think we should all be helping each other move forward in this moment. You will go on and do great things, and we're right behind you. And some of us still have our foot in the door making sure it stays open. Ladies and gentlemen, Ariana Afsar.
My name is Ari Afsar and I am so excited to be here with you. I am a singer, songwriter, and storyteller, and a proud Bangladeshi American. And I am excited to be here with this celebration today. Uh, I am the composer of Jeanette, which is a musical based off of Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected into U.S. federal office four years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave white women the right to vote. This song, We Won't Sleep, is the reckoning and the realization that access to equity and justice is a continuous fight that we must bear together. The song is the end of Act Two, and it's called We Won't Sleep. We've been trying, woman, a child Could make it easy, could live in denial We saw the world end, but it keeps spinning Whether we're losing, whether we're winning Then they start to fade while we're wide awake And feeling alive Been staying up late Cause we know the stakes of losing a life We won't sleep out They'll try to get us But we gon' reach out Reach out for love We won't sleep No, not till it's over Even with the blurry eyes Baby, we won't compromise I dreamed in color When I was younger Painted a picture, one hand in the other Now I see shadows outside my window But I won't close them, no, not when we know That they start to fade while we're wide awake And feeling alive Been staying up late Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Judy Chu. Hello and happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I'm Congress member Judy Chu, and as the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, I'm so thrilled to be a part of today's virtual DNC AAPI Caucus celebration. I especially want to thank your fearless leader, Bell Young Hong, for her incredible work leading the DNC AAPI caucus. Despite what a challenging year it's been, we have so much to celebrate this month. Thanks to your hard work, we saw the Democratic Party and the Biden campaign make unprecedented investments in the AAPI community during the 2020 cycle. And as a result, 
AAPI voters turned out in record numbers to help elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris maintain our House majority and flip the Senate. In fact, voter turnout among AAPI skyrocketed more than any other racial group, increasing by over 45%. But not only that, AAPI early and absentee voting increased by 300% in 13 of the most contested presidential battleground states, with over two thirds of AAPI voters supporting Joe Biden. This made a tremendous difference in key battleground states like Georgia, where we saw a tremendous increase in AAPI voter turnout, including over 30,000 first time AAPI voters. And in a state where the presidential race came down to just about 12,000 votes, there's no doubt that the Asian American community helped to secure Joe Biden's victory. That's why I've been saying for so many years that the AAPI community has gone from being marginalized to being the margin of victory. And let me tell you why this is important, because with our growing AAPI numbers in Congress and Kamala Harris as our first woman, Asian and black vice president in history, the AAPI community has more power and influence than ever before. This is more important now than ever as our community continues to face a surge in anti-Asian hate crimes tied to the pandemic. In March, our nation was shocked and horrified by the murder of eight people in Georgia, including six Asian women at the three Asian owned spas. Nothing could be more deliberate and intentional. And there's no doubt in my mind that these shootings were a hate crime. That's why I wrote a letter to the Department of Justice urging them to investigate it as such. And earlier this month, that is exactly what prosecutors in Georgia did when they said they would seek enhanced hate crime charges against the shooter. But this was not an isolated incident. Since the start of the pandemic, there have been over 6,600 reported anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents fueled by Donald Trump's usage of the terms China virus and Kung flu, fanning the flames of xenophobia and directing anger and blame at Asian Americans. And the attacks have gotten increasingly worse, leaving many Asian Americans wondering, will I be next? That's why we in KPAC have been taking action since the very start of the pandemic with press conferences, statements, letters, hearings, and legislation. And fortunately, we've already gotten help from such an important partner, President Biden. Within his first week in office, President Biden issued a presidential memorandum to address anti-Asian hate. And just last week, as part of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, two significant pieces of legislation passed out of Congress. First was my resolution to condemn anti-Asian bigotry and honor the lives that were tragically lost in Georgia, which passed out of the House by a bipartisan vote of 244 to 180. And then the House passed Senator Maisie Rona and Congresswoman Grace Meng's COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act with an even stronger bipartisan vote of 364 to 62. Because it passed both houses, it was sent to President Biden's desk and I'll never forget standing behind him at the White House at that historic moment, watching him sign this bill into law. After a year of anti-Asian prejudice and violence, it means so much to know that the voices of the AAPI community helped to create this new law to address anti-Asian hate crimes and to protect all Americans from hate. So this Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, there is much to celebrate, but there's also so much work ahead. And that is why I'm so excited about our next segment. Over the years, the AAPI community has made such tremendous strides in the entertainment industry. Next, we will hear from Asian American actors and about their experiences over the last four decades. When I first started in the industry, uh, obviously we saw nothing on the small or the big screen that represented us. When I first started acting, it had been 20 years since the first all Asian American TV show. When I competed for the title of Miss America, I actually started competing because I felt that the Miss America organization 
did not represent who the girl next door was, which is something that they had been known for, the ideal. And I grew up watching Miss America, feeling like I could never fit in that role because I didn't look a certain way. You know, I grew up my entire life without really seeing any Asians that I can look up to on TV. We actually protested in front of public theater uh, to, to say that we're not getting the parts that, that we should be getting. And we're not, you know, included in your Shakespeare festival. So we'd like to be a part of that. And we would like to do some plays. Uh, and he, and um, Joe Papp, you know, who was uh, uh, running the, the public theater at the time, came out and said, uh, well, bring me some plays. They kind of shut us up because we didn't have any. <laughs> we, we, we didn't have a play that we could have brought to him and say, well, this is our experience. This is the Asian American experience in a play. Because I know when I was a kid, I never said, I want to be Shang-Chi when we were playing superhero games. I said, I want to be Superman, Batman, or Thor, or Spider-Man. You know, there was never, there was never an Asian superhero for kids to look up to. I, and, and I learned a, a big lesson really from um, Robert Townsend, you know, uh, on Hollywood Shovel. That film was about the experience of the black actors in the, in the business. And they constantly being asked to go in there, you know, uh, uh, to do jive. You know, oh, you're not black enough, you know? And, and meanwhile, all these guys are classically trained. And Robert Townsend said, you know what? Don't do it. It's always a job at the post office. And I always kept that to heart. And from that day on, I try not to accept anything that I cannot salvage. So that was the beginning of my humble acting career. So I didn't do that much because there wasn't much to do. I performed a classical fusion Bollywood piece for my talent. And I remember when I was competing, people telling me, Nina, if you're really serious about winning Miss America, change your talent because Bollywood will never win. You're too Indian, be more American. As the show went on, Asians became more acceptable and Fresh on the Boat was enjoyed by many. And then after the show went on, you know, there's other Asian shows popped up beside us, you know, like Dr. Ken. And then, you know, the big one that everyone knows, uh, Crazy Asians, and that really opened up the world into a whole new era, if you'd say, of Asian American representation. Uh, it basically opened the eyes of people in the business that Asians can be successful, funny, and profitable, which is most important, apparently the whole world started asking for more Asian content. The opportunities today, I think there are a lot of factors that came, you know, that built that to this point. You know, I think Oscar Too White was a big deal. Uh, the Me Too movement was a big deal to give Asians to women and, 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 and to be heard, you know. Those are, those, those are really foundations you know, of what's happened today. And, and you know, people start to do their own stuff, you know, and, and, and a lot of independent filmmakers, you know, were knowing that probably they're not going to make a dime. You know, we're just going to do this project because we want to do it. And hopefully, you know, we'll find an audience. I don't think you should do a project to look for an audience. You do the project and the audience will come. I think you will, the audience will find you. I am so excited for the future of the AAPI community. I feel like our time is now. I see so many people embracing our ethnicity, our heritage, our culture, our traditions, and bringing that into mainstream um, American culture. And so, yeah, I kind of went from Asian Americans not being on TV at all to now being you know, in a Marvel movie, a big step in six years. Sharing our stories, sharing our hardships, sharing our vulnerabilities that we've had. The best way to deal with hate and you know, inequality is education and having Asian American faces and culture and history on TV is the best way to show the world and also show ourselves who we are. And we're not there to please anybody other than to tell your story. And hopefully that story will resonate in some way. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Raja Krishnamurthy. Hi everybody, I'm Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy from the 8th District of Illinois. Thank you to the DNC's AAPI Caucus for having this event. 
Thank you for everything that you do in uh, remembering our history uh, and sharing our resiliency and power, the themes of today's event. I want to say a special thank you to Bell and the leadership of the AAPI Caucus. And I, would say, I want to say a special thank you to all of you for everything that you do for your families, our communities, and our country. And uh, I can't wait to hopefully meet again in person soon. In the meantime, please be well and please take care. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Mark Takano. And I'm Congressman Mark Takano. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you to DNC API Caucus Chair uh, Bao Leong Hong. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, the DNC Chairman, uh, Jamie Harrison. Uh, as a proud Japanese American and second vice chair of KPAC, it's always an honor to join the DNC AAPI Caucus. And I wanted to say to everyone, happy AAPI Heritage Month. We are nearing the end of the month, but that doesn't mean we will stop telling our stories or raising awareness about AAPI uh, uh, experiences in our country. In fact, it is more important than ever to continue telling our stories. And as our last uh, uh, segment uh, you know, intimated, uh, telling our stories and, and uh, hopefully they resonate. Uh, we need to be living our truths. This past year uh, has been incredibly challenging to our Asian Americans who have battled two viruses, not just one virus, but two viruses, the COVID-19 virus and the virus of racism that plagues our country. The experience of APIs is all too familiar to us, but many in our nation are not aware that discrimination and violence against AAPIs can be traced back for generations, which is why today's focus on the importance of teaching AAPI history is so relevant. I was a public school teacher for more than 20 years in California. My parents and grandparents were interned by the US government during World War II. Yet I'm still find it shocking that this history, my family's history, uh, is really not being taught in our schools uh, to the extent it needs to be taught. From the Chinese Exclusion Act to the Japanese American internment, every student, every American needs to know how decades of unjust policies have shaped the AAPI experience. And that's why I'm so proud of the work that Conscious Kid and everyone behind this project is doing to educate the public. We cannot tolerate hate and discrimination. And as President Biden said last week, uh, before he signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, hate cannot be given a safe harbor in America. So there must be a reckoning before reconciliation. And there must be reconciliation before we reach unity. The Conscious Kid Library and the stories they are telling are important to helping us achieve just that. So thank you. Hi, I'm Sheetal Sheth, and it is so lovely to be here celebrating the amazing work of our community. We are here and we are making our voices heard. To that end, I am humbled to tell you about the latest initiative the Conscious Kid has spearheaded. Did you know that out of all racial groups, AAPIs receive the least attention in school curriculum and textbooks? In an effort to amplify Api stories and make them accessible, The Conscious Kid teamed up with Wang Fu Productions and some of our favorites, Harry Shum Jr., Padma Lakshmi, Ming Na Wen, and Randall Park on a series of Api Storytime read-alouds. These read-alouds are on the YouTube Kids app and on their website. And with the help of Google for Education and $120,000, they were able to donate a collection of 10 books each to over a thousand Title I preschool and elementary schools. I am the author of one of them, Always Anjali. Anjali, you do know we picked your name out especially for you. A name whose meaning would capture your spirit. My name means something? Anjali peeked her head out. Anjali is a gift, the most precious kind, divine, just like you. Be proud of who you are, Anjali. To be different 
is to be marvelous. My name is Harry Shum Jr. and today I'll be reading Grandpa Grumps by Katrina Moore and Cindy Yen. Mama, why is Ye Ye such a grump? He shows love in other ways, said Mama. Oops, she waited for Ye Ye to grumble, but he didn't. Soon, Ye Ye was laughing so hard, his belly jiggled up and down. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ming-Na Wen. Today, I'll be reading Eyes That Kiss in the Corners by Joanna Ho and illustrated by Zhang Ho. I have eyes that kiss in the corners and glow like warm tea. My eyes are just like Mama's. My eyes that kiss in the corners and glow like warm tea are a revolution. How great is that? These titles not only include oppy representation, they include real life counter narratives about how to navigate and disrupt anti-Asian racism. What is anti-Asian racism, you ask? Anti-Asian racism is when someone is harmed or treated unfairly for just being Asian. Experiences of anti-Asian racism are often ignored, so it's important for us to talk about it and spread the word. Through these stories, we can be proud of who we are and celebrate not only for our differences, but also our similarities. We hope that they serve as a starting point towards conversations, countering anti-Asian bias, and making sure Abis are included and seen in classrooms and curriculum. So, after this event is done, get your family, snuggle up, and put on a story time. I promise you, you'll love it. What better way to enjoy an evening with your loved ones than listening to one of these stories? We have to start young. They are our future, and the future is bright. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eric Salcedo. I'm the Asian American and Pacific Islander Outreach Director for the DNC. And it is my honor to introduce the, exec the Deputy Executive Director of the DNC, Roger Lau. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I could not be more grateful to have the chance to work with you and, of course, our fear fearless leader, Ma Bell, Bell Yong Hong, at the DNC. It's a real honor. Hello, everyone. Happy Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Island Heritage Month. What an amazing night of education, reflection, inspiration, and a night of celebration of our diverse and beautiful community. Our civic leaders, our art, uh, artists, activists, and most exciting to me, a celebration of our contributions, our accomplishments, and a shared commitment to taking on the challenges we have ahead together as a community. Thank you all for all you did in 2020, all of the planning, phone calling, door knocking to get your neighbors involved. Thank you for asking your friends and family to give time and money they didn't have, and all the sleep, 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 sleepless nights you put in last year to flip the Senate, elect President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, and to give us a real chance to make real change. So I know it's early, and Joe Biden and the Democrats have already started to, to deliver on the promise of building back better, but we at the DNC are already planning for the next election because we have because we have so much work to do and Bell, Eric and I can't do it without you. So together, we're going to recruit and train volunteers and community organizers and elect leaders who share our values and help us continue to build the power of the AA and AHPI community, our community. Together, we will only get AAPI stronger. Thank you for being a part of this. Ladies and gentlemen, celebrated playwright and Tony winner, David Henry Huang. The song you're about to hear is from my latest musical, Soft Power, written with composer Janine Tesori, centering on our role as AAPIs in our country's ongoing struggle to protect democracy. Soft Power was a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in Drama and a Grammy nominee for Best Musical Theater Album this year. Now, singing Democracy from Soft Power, Grammy Award winner and Tony nominee from the original cast of Hamilton, Philippa Sue. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know better than you. I know, I know, I know, I know. 
Oh, I know this much is true. So many times it's left me better bruised, disillusioned in pain, feeling I've been Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman of the DNC AAPI Caucus, Ms. Bell Leong Hong. Thank you, David and Pippa. Democracy, democracy, democracy. It is becoming our API Caucus signature song. If you may remember, we brought uh, the, our caucus meeting in uh, at the convention uh, and at, again at the Lunar New Year uh, with democracy as the final song. So it is very fitting that in the celebration of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month that we bring democracy to help us close this event. Uh, before I, I, I uh, proceed with the final words, I'd like to invite our DNC chair, Jamie Harrison, to say a few final words. Thank, thank you again, Bell, and thank you for everyone for participating uh, tonight. This was an absolutely wonderful event. 
You know, Bell, I want to leave everybody with a quote from uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's from his letter from a Birmingham jail. He said in that letter, he said, we will repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. My friends, in the face of hate, in the face of bigotry, in the face of division, we can no longer be silent. We can't sit on the sidelines. We have to stand up and be silent no more. So I want you all to know that as we celebrate AAPI uh, Heritage Month, let's also make sure that we are celebrating and standing up with our brothers and our sisters in the AAPI community. We will not be silent in the face of hate and bigotry and division. N not anymore. Those days are done. We're standing up all together. So again, Bell, thank you for uh, your leadership and putting all of this uh, fantastic program together. Thank you for all of those who participated tonight. It was a wonderful celebration and I'm happy that we and the folks at the DNC were able to be a part of. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you for standing with us. And I know that it is not just words. I know it is actions. I know that each and every single one of our brothers and sisters uh, in the DNC family stands with all of us uh, in, as we journey together. Um, so everybody, I hope you enjoyed this event tonight. Uh, we had some serious talks. We had some wonderful music. We had some feel good stories. And yes, we also had some very energizing words, uh, but most especially, uh, this is a time for us to recognize the work of those that worked so hard this last year, each and every one of you for your leadership, for all of that you have done and contributed, not only in terms of time, in terms of resources, and in time of your energy and your commitment. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, uh, from me and from the entire DNC family. I want to thank, take this opportunity to also thank all of the incredible Asian American and Pacific Islander Congressional Caucus and senators who joined us. I especially wanted to give a shout out to uh, uh, KPAC Chair Judy Chu, uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng, Chairman Bobby Scott, Chairman uh, Mark Takano, uh, Congressman Ted Liu, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, and Congressman Kai Kahele. And now I also want to give a special thank you to my DNC AAPI Creative Advisory Committee for their advice, their guidance, their patience, their wisdom, their generosity, and most importantly, your friendship. Without you, we could not have put together this event. And so I thank you from the bottom of my heart. A special thank you to all of the political and entertainment stars who so generously contributed their time and their talent to our events. And a special shout out to Daniel Day Kim for being the champion of, to the DNC. And most importantly, I wanna thank my DNC family from my chair, Jamie Harrison, CEO, Sam Cornelli, and especially my API political and outreach director, Eric Salcedo, and the deputy CEO, Roger Lau. I am very, very fortunate to have the DNC family that cares and understands our needs. Thank you everybody and good night.